abuse and addiction should be treated not as criminal issues, but as health issues. And what that means is that we need a revolution in mental health treatment in America. All over this country, all over this country, including in my own state of Vermont, there are people in dire need, people who are suicidal, people who may even be homicidal, people who are addicted to drugs. They need help and they need it today, not six months from today. Now, one of the achievements of this campaign that I am very, very proud of is that we have revolutionized campaign financing in a presidential election. You know, when we began this campaign, we had to make a very simple decision. Do we do what every other campaign has done? I didn't even ask the question yet. You gave me the answer. You're right. The question is, do we go out and have a super PAC and beg Wall Street and billionaires for money? And that is the right answer, and that is what we have done. And I am... I am enormously proud that in our campaign, what we have done is not gone to Wall Street, not to the drug companies. We have gone to the middle class and working class of this country, and we have received now almost 8 million individual campaign contributions. That is more campaign contributions than any candidate in the history of this country up until this point. Now, Secretary Clinton has chosen a different path to raise money. She has not one, but a number of super PACs, and she has raised at least $15 million from Wall Street. She has also given speeches on Wall Street for $225,000 a speech. I do not believe that you transform America that you take on Wall Street, that you break up the major banks on Wall Street by taking their money. This campaign is listening to young people. And what young people are telling me is something really quite amazing when you think about it. What they are telling me is how does it happen that when they do exactly the right thing, what the country needs, what their community needs, and that is go out and get the best education that they can, how does it happen that they end up thirty, fifty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 in debt? Now think outside. What this campaign is about is asking Americans to think outside of the box, outside of the options the media gives you. Think for a second. We are living in a competitive global economy. We need the best educated workforce in the world. We should be encouraging every American to get all of the education he or she needs, not punishing people for getting that education. And think about this. Think about the fact that 50, 40 years ago, if you had a high school degree in California or Vermont, you know what? You could go out and get yourself a pretty good job and make it into the middle class. That's what a high school degree did 40, 50 years ago. That is not by and large the case today. 
Technology has changed. The economy has changed. People need more education. That's the fact. Given that reality, what seems clear to me is that when we talk about public education, we can't just continue to talk about first grade through 12th grade. We have got to make public colleges and universities tuition free. Does anybody, does anybody here, this is a serious question, think that making public colleges and universities tuition free is a radical idea? No. It is not. It's not a radical idea. It's a commonsensical idea. It exists in Germany. It exists in Scandinavia and other countries around the world. And guess what? This may shock the young people. It used to exist in California 50 years ago. Fifty years ago, you could go to the great University of California, one of the great public universities in the world, virtually tuition free. Well, if California and the United States could provide great education virtually free 50 years ago, and that's not just California, it is states all over America, if we could do it, 50 years ago, we damn well can and must do it today. How many people here today are carrying student debt? There are millions of Americans struggling with 30, 50, 80 thousand dollars of student debt year after year, decade after decade, some of them are paying back that debt. Now, in my view, what we should do with student debt is give people who have those loans the ability to refinance those loans at the lowest interest rates they can find. Right now, we have people who literally cannot get married, they can't buy a home, they can't have kids because they're carrying this debt. That's crazy. Let's change their ability to pay it back. Now here's what thinking outside of the box is about. Here is what taking on the establishment is about. People say to me, you know, Bernie, you're a nice guy, you're Santa Claus. You're giving away, you're giving them, must be my white hair, I don't know. I don't have the beard, but. And what they say is, you're giving away free tuition at public colleges and universities. That's how you're going to lower student debt. Yeah, nice guy. How are you going to pay for it? I will tell you exactly how we are going to pay for it. All of you know that eight, nine years ago, the greed, the recklessness, and the illegal behavior on Wall Street drove this country into the worst economic downturn since the 1930s. And then all these big executives on Wall Street, they went crawling to the United States Congress and they said, please bail us out. We'll be good boys. Well, I didn't vote for that bailout, but it carried. It seems to me that right now, you know, Wall Street's doing just great. Their CEO's making zillions of dollars a year. It seems to me that now is the time to impose a tax on Wall Street speculation. And that tax would bring in more than enough money to make public colleges and universities tuition-free and substantially lower student debt. The American people bailed out Wall Street. It is Wall Street's time to help the middle class and working people of this country.
This campaign is listening to the American people and not just billionaire campaign contributors. We are listening to our brothers and sisters in the Latino community. And the Latino community is sick and tired of people like Donald Trump and their insults. There are 11 million undocumented people in this country today. And let me tell you, this is not widely discussed, but every day some of those people are being exploited ruthlessly by their employers. They are being exploited because when you have no legal rights, you can't stand up for yourself. So you could be underpaid, overworked, and cheated on the job, and there's nothing you can do about it. In my view, the United States Congress must pass comprehensive immigration reform and a path toward citizenship. And if the Congress does not do its job, and repair this broken immigration system, I will use the executive powers of the President to make that happen. Together we will end, together we will end the current deportation policies. Our job is to unite families, bring them together, not divide them up. This campaign is listening to the African American community. I have been all over this country. During this campaign, I've been to Flint, Michigan, where children have been poisoned by lead in the water. I have been to Detroit, Michigan, where their public school system is on the verge of collapse and kids are getting totally inadequate education. I have been to Baltimore, Maryland, where tens of thousands of people are addicted to heroin and cannot get the treatment that they need. And the African-American community is asking me, how does it happen that this country has trillions of dollars to spend on a war in Iraq we never should have gotten into? But somehow, supposedly, we don't have enough money to rebuild inner cities in America. We don't have enough money to provide good education, good health care, affordable housing to inner city America. Together, we are going to change our national priorities. This campaign is listening to the pain of a people whose voices are very rarely heard, and that is the Native American community. All of you know that the Native American people, even before this country became a country, when settlers first came here, Native American people were lied to, they were cheated, and treaties they negotiated were broken. That's just the fact. And all of you know that we owe a debt of gratitude to the Native American people that in many respects we can never repay. <laughs> Among so many other things, Native Americans have taught us a very, very profound lesson that we must learn. And that is that as human beings, we are part of nature. We must live with nature. And that if we destroy nature, 
we are destroying ourselves. That is what the Native American people have taught us, and we better damn well learn that lesson. But today, if you go to Native American res re reservations, and I was at Pine Ridge in South Dakota a couple of weeks ago, what I saw was unbelievable. That reservation has a standard of living that is lower than many third world countries. Life expectancy, how long people live, is lower than third world countries. Poverty off the charts, unemployment, youth suicide, unbelievably high. If elected president, we will, in a very significant way, change the relationship of the federal government to the Native American people. I am a member of the U.S. Senate Committee on the Environment. And I have talked to scientists all over our country and all over the world. And what they have told me is what you in California already know. And that is that climate change is real. You know that. Climate change is caused by human activity. You know that. And you know in California that climate change is already causing devastating problems in this country and throughout the world. We have a moral responsibility to make certain that the planet we leave our children and future generations is one that is healthy and habitable. And together, we are going to tell the fossil fuel industry that their short-term profits are not more important than the future of this planet. Now I'm going to put on the local school hat. <laughs> <laughs> now, when we think outside of the box, when we think outside of the status quo, every American should ask themselves a pretty simple question, and that is, why is the United States the only major country on Earth not to guarantee health care to all people as a right? How come the United Kingdom does it, France does it, Germany does it, Italy does it, Scandinavia does it? I live 50 miles away from Canada. They do it up there. So let me be very honest with you and tell you what I believe. I believe that health care is a right of all people, not a privilege. The Affordable Care Act has done some very good things. But we have got to go further. How many people here have no health insurance? How many people here are underinsured with high deductibles and high copayments? Okay. It is time for us to take on the private insurance companies and pass a Medicare for all health care program. It is time for us to tell the drug companies that they are not going to charge us the highest prices in the world for the medicine we need. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, all of you know that real change never takes place from the top on down. Real change always takes place from the bottom on up. That is the history 
of the workers movement in this country when workers a hundred plus years ago they stood together and they said to their employers we don't want to work seven days a week and fourteen hours a day we don't want kids ten years of age working in factories treat us with dignity and they formed trade unions to protect the interest of working people that is the history of the civil rights movement wherein during the abomination of slavery during the worst times african americans and their allies said the day will come when we will rid this country of racism and segregation and bigotry and we will never know how many brave people died in that struggle went to jail in that struggle, lost their jobs in their struggle, but millions of people stood up and fought back against racism. <laughs> the children don't know it, but for the kids who are here, I hope you do know it and learn it. Less than a hundred years ago, women in America did not have the right to vote, did not have the right to get the education they wanted, or the jobs they wanted. Now, we take it for granted. We go out, we have women police officers, we got women in the military. Do you think, you know, you have more than half of medical school students are now women? And everybody says, oh, well, this, that's the way it is. That is not the way it is. That took struggle on the part of women and their male allies. And said to women, you know, 100 years ago, hey, women, your job is to stay home, take care of the house and our babies. But you got to put yourself back there 100 years ago. And the courage of these women to say, I'm sorry, you will not define my life and who I am. And women and their male allies said, women in America will not be second-class citizens. You want to hear about change? This is change. If we were here 10 years ago, which is no time at all from an historical perspective, and somebody jumps up and says, you know, Bernie, I think that maybe by the year 2015, gay marriage will be legal in every state in this country. Do you know, do you know what the person next to her would have said? The person next to her would have said, you are nuts. There is too much, there is too much bigotry, too much homophobia in America. It just can't happen. But you know what occurred? The gay community all across this country and their straight allies stood up, fought back, and they said, they said, and believe me, this was not something easy. They said that in America, people will have the right to love whoever they want, regardless of their gender. That didn't happen. That didn't happen by accident. It happened because people were incredibly courageous and prepared to struggle. Let me give you another example, even more contemporary. If we were here five years ago, somebody jumps up and says, you know, Bernie, this $7.25 an hour federal minimum wage is a starvation wage. We have got to raise that wage to $15 an hour. Person next to him would have said, $15 an hour, you're out of your mind. You want to more than double the minimum wage. Well, maybe we can go to eight bucks, nine bucks an hour, but 15, you're too radical, you're thinking too big, you're crazy. But what happened is very brave workers in the fast food industry, in McDonald's and at Burger King and at Wendy's, they went out on strike. And they told their neighbors and the whole country they can't make it on seven and a quarter an hour. And then 
a couple of years ago, Seattle, Washington, 15 bucks an hour. San Francisco, Los Angeles, 15 bucks an hour. California, New York State, 15 bucks an hour. And if I'm elected president, 15 bucks an hour in every state in this country. Now, what is my point for taking you through that short journey of American history? The point is that the establishment always tells people that their dreams and their aspirations are impossible to achieve. That you've got to think small, not big. But what I am seeing, and I have been all over this country, what I am seeing is that millions of people in our great nation are beginning to question in a very fundamental way the status quo of today. What people are asking is, why does it happen that we have more income and wealth inequality than any other major country on earth? Why does it happen that I have to work two or three jobs and almost all new income and wealth goes to the top 1%? Why does it happen that the job I had in a factory ended because the company shut down and moved to China? Why does it happen if I am a woman that I'm making 79 cents on the dollar compared to men? Why does it happen that if I am a college graduate, I end up 50, 70, 90 thousand dollars in debt? Why does it happen that if I am a little child, I may have to go hungry or even sleep out in some car in this country because there is a lack of affordable housing? Why does it happen that in America we remain the only major country not to guarantee health care to all people? And the American people are beginning to catch on. And they're beginning to understand that in the richest country in the history of the world, we can do much, much better than we are doing today. And they understand that the only way that happens, and that is what this campaign is about, is when millions of people from coast to coast stand up together fight back for their kids and their parents and demand a government which represents all of us, not just the 1%. This campaign is not just about electing a president, it is about transforming a nation. On June 7th, there is going to be an enormously important primary here in California. There will be 475 delegates at stake. Now, what I have learned throughout this campaign is we win when voter turnout is high. If voter turnout is high, with your help, we are going to win the lion's share of those delegates. And if we, if we can win big here in California, our largest state, one of our most progressive states, if we can win big here, we're going to have the momentum taking us into the Democratic Convention to win the nomination. And if we win the nomination, I assure you, Donald Trump will not become President of the United States.
So I ask you all, on June 7th, come out and vote, mail in your ballots early, get your friends and your family to vote. And if we have a large voter turnout on June 7th, we're going to win and win big. Let's make it happen. Thank you all very much.